we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Hewins. Some of you may have recognized me from some other webinars throughout the fall. I work in the admissions office with Molly Pettengill. Um, and with me today, I have my colleague, Marin. Marin, do you want to introduce us? Hi, my name is Marin Brennan. I am um, assistant director of admissions and I went to RISD as an undergrad, but I'm really excited to be here today to help you learn more about our graduate program in painting. And we are joined today by Dwayne Slick. Dwayne, you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure. Hello, I'm Dwayne Slick. I'm the graduate program director for this year. Um, and yes, professor of painting and printmaking. Excellent. Awesome. So this session is going to be casual. Um, Dwayne will just provide an overview of the program, but we'll be leaving most of the session to questions. Feel free throughout to type your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. I ask you to put it in the Q&A and not the chat so we can make sure to answer them on a first come first serve basis and we don't miss anybody. We'll be putting some helpful links in the chat so I don't want your question to get lost. But with that, Dwayne, it's all yours. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, welcome. Um, let's see. Yes, the painting departments. Uh, first of all, just some numbers. The painting department um, has 140 students total, uh, about 120, sometimes 130 undergrad painting majors, um, and 20 uh, grad students. And what we're looking for are 10 students per class. So if you were to apply and to be accepted and came, um, your cohort would consist of 10 folks. And we do provide studios, first year studios, and then uh, second year studios that are a little larger. Um, what else? Let's see, numbers, numbers, numbers. Uh, painting program is one of the larger in the fine arts division. Um, we have, a, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of information to unpack here. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, uh, let me, we usually give like, you know, like TAs, all the students do a TA, studio TAs, and that allows you to kind of mix with the, the undergrad population. When we begin to quickly understand are a rather intense group of people. Um, it's a very active community. And um, yeah, I'm not used to doing that webinars. <laughs> no problem, Dwayne. And again, <laughs> we can make this casual. If you wanted to talk about like the curriculum a little bit, it's two years. Talk about yeah. the fall and the spring, um, specifically the winter session as well, because that's unique to RISD. Yeah. Um, so that'd be a good place to start. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, the uh, fall semester is grad, grad painting one, and it's a six credit course. Um, and in addition to that, there's a grad drawing class. Um, you're, just, you're there with your cohort of 10. And then there's a grad print project course um, in which we mix both the incoming, the new printmaking grads and the um, painting grads. Um, and you're working with the printmaking faculty. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of silk screen, but it's also a lot of alternative processes as well. Um, then there's our winter session, which is a five week winter session. Um, in January into early February. So that's a that's a period of time when you can take an elective. Sometimes people do travel courses, sometimes people do independent studies. Um, but it's a it's a great time to kind of you know sample some of these other departments. Like a lot of our people um, are taking uh, color theory. Um, and there are people taking courses in sculpture and ceramics and some taking classes, well, film and video or uh, glass. So there's, you know, there's a lot of resource here at the school. Um, next in the spring semester for the first year grad, what you would be doing 
is a uh, grad painting, you know, grad painting two. And then we have a first year seminar called Meaning in the Medium of Paint. And uh, you would be working with uh, uh, an outside critic who runs that course. And then of course you have slots for your uh, um, electives, which could be you know anything from seminars in contemporary art. There's a lot of graduate level interdisciplinary courses where you're mingling and, and taking classes with uh, folks from sculpture, ceramics, textiles. Um, so yeah, that's that's the first year. In addition, the painting department, we host six visiting artists per year. And uh, for most of you, yeah, well, for everyone, we want everyone to have critiques with uh, up to three of those visitors. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's all of the other activities that are taking place. Um, um, a lot of all the departments are all hosting different visiting artists. And of course, we're just, you know, we're right next to, we're just butted right up against Brown University. And Brown University also has an uh, active uh, gallery, museum, as well as a lecture series. So those are part of the resources of the community. Uh, it is possible um, for folks to also uh, take classes at Brown. Um, they're on a different schedule, but it is possible. It happens. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's one other thing to kind of think about. Second year, things start to get a little heavier. Um, there's grad paint three, and then there's there's time for more of your electives. Um, the other course that the grads during the fall semester of their second year, they have a course called Three Critics, which um, are taught by three um short-term faculty there they are uh, uh, either critics or critics writers or curators or some hybrid of all three and the three of them um you meet with them for four times during the semester um and uh they run their own sort of they have their own syllabi covering different interests the last one included public art Another one included the uh, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian um, futurisms. Um, and then what else? Um, and then there's winter session. Hope you're getting all this. Uh, and then the final semester is your thesis semester, where your, uh, your grad paint class is a 12 credit course. And by that point, what you're doing is you're finishing up you're working on or you're realizing your final body of work your thesis project as well as I believe it's a three to 3600 word uh, written thesis um and so there is a thesis exhibition at the end of that and in the meantime during the second year we also continue to have uh, uh, our six visiting artists, um, as well as, you know, shared programming with other departments. How's that? That was great. Thank okay. you so much, Wayne. And if Marin just put in the links to the digital commons where the master's theses are collected, you want to just select painting on there and you'll see all of them there. And then the digital publication of the thesis exhibition show um, that was this past May. I also put a YouTube video um, of the show as well. Um, it's a very large scale. We have it at the convention center in Rhode Island. Um, last year, we had the largest graduating class. So they rented out two exhibition halls. It was massive. I felt like I, I went a couple of times and I kept on seeing something new. Um, but it is the um, highlight of, of the year. Everybody does look forward to that. All right, let's see here. I uh, know, let's see here. Um, and Dwayne, let's see. Um, feel free to start typing your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. One of the questions that we get a lot um, in regards to the application process, because a lot of these people are prospective students, is the portfolio. 
Can you speak to what it is that you're looking for um, in the a MFA painting portfolio? Um, yeah, how, I'm trying to remember how many images they have. They have um, 10 to 20. They can 10, do 10 to 20 images. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> if you have the opportunity, uh, definitely include more than 10 images. Um, because sometimes it's like, you know, people want to see as much as possible. Um, you don't really want to see uh, like a lot of exercises. Um, sometimes people will, will submit things like the, you know, their model drawings or something like that. Um, uh, we want to be able to kind of see, get a sense of who you are, your depth and your breadth as an artist. Um, one of the things that, um, I've always told prospective grads is um, it's sometimes a good idea to uh, include in your portfolio an installation shot. And what that means is um, you find a space uh, that looks very sort of white cube gallery kind of space, exhibition space. Uh, make sure it's completely clean. There's, you know, I've had to tell people to do this specifically. Um, everything's cleaned up. Um, and the idea is to show the work, document it with maybe like in a corner of a room, um, but to give your reviewer an idea of the physical presence of your work. Um, because a lot of times when you when we're looking at images digitally, um, you can't really tell what size it is. And those those decisions about what size you're working um, affect how the work can be interpreted. So the idea, part of the idea is to give us an idea of, of your work's physical presence. So it's a good idea, even it's, to me, it's even more helpful um than including a detail unless you have if you absolutely think you need a detail put the detail in but at the same time you know i do recommend considering putting in one installation shot and occasionally you know just for scale somebody might have a friend a pal you know just kind of either walking in the vicinity of the work in front of the work or something like that Something where you just see the back of them staring at, you know, at the work. But the idea, again, is, you know, I've sat on many juries for uh, grants and residencies um, in which a good installation shot can be a make or break moment for that person's portfolio. So, yeah, think about that. That's great. Thank you but so also, much, Wayne. Yeah, present a good range of work, you know. Um, you know, we, you're not trying to get into a show, you're trying to get in, into an educational program. Um, here, at, you know, at, at the school, you're going to be challenged. Um, your work, you know, you're going to have your cohort that you're going to be in conversation with, um, your guest artists, but you're also assigned, you know, faculty, um, key, you know, lead critique faculty throughout the year um that will be meeting with you weekly to talk about what's happening in your studios as well as giving you readings and asking you questions um so it's you know it's it's an intense experience that's great thank you so much all right, let's dive into some of the questions that we have in the q a section and i encourage everybody to start typing your questions in there is no right or wrong question. And so I bet somebody else has the same question as you. So feel free to type them in. Um, this person's asking, is airbrushing allowed in individual studios? When I say airbrushing, I don't mean the use of spray gun, but airbrushes for detailing that do not produce overspray and air contamination. I'm assuming this is like a small airbrush if you're talking about detail. Um, yes, you can use airbrush in studios. Um, anything really powerful that needs a spray booth, that's, that's a whole different game. 
And I get a lot of questions that I get a lot too is like, what do the studios, what do individual private studios look like for MFA painting students? Can you describe a little bit about what people can anticipate with that? Yeah, the square footage question. Uh, the first year studios are basically they're like a large space. Um, boy, I don't have the numbers. Uh, I, memorized i want to say at least 500 square feet of space per person per person okay that's great and that's during the first year during the second year you move up to a um yeah it, it's like a one room that's divided into um and so you have you know a studio mate basically um the second years have private private spaces and they're large. And mo most of them are contained in, I forget the name of the building. Yeah, it's Fletcher Building. Fletcher Building. And all of the grad studios, not all of them, but in the fine arts, we have one building called Fletcher that has a uh, painting on the second and third floor, printmaking, um, sculpture, photography, and some glass folks are in, the, in that building. So it's like you're mingling some degree with all of those people and there are and two rooms two large rooms that are dedicated as a shared critique space that's great thank you and Marin just put a link in um, that shows some pictures of the grad studios and there's a couple of Fletcher um, where you can get um, a look at some of the spaces it's like prime prime providence real estate some of these studios okay that's great thank you um all right, this is a really good question and I would lean to Dwayne's expertise on this, but this person's curious on what success looks like for a painting alumni. What success look like? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, everybody's got one idea about success. Uh, there's a shared idea about uh, um, exhibiting the work um, getting picked up by galleries and that that does happen um maybe i don't think it's you know across the board for everyone but there is a there is to me it's like you know the people everybody who graduates they go on to different things some folks you know they they move to different areas they're looking um towards you know their goals of, of having family um and so they structure some of their lives and their practice around all of that. Um, what else? Uh, there is the gallery scene. Um, we have, apparently, uh, I'm told there are sections of uh, um, Williamsburg that are, uh, you know, whole blocks of RISD uh, alum. Um, you, yeah, because once you're once you graduate from here, it's like. Um, you're connected to a different kind of network. And a lot of people, you know, they do, you know, the cohorts stay very close and uh, support each other as well. So I, I will that add that we have a very robust um, alumni here yeah. at RISD. Um, we have um, uh, RISD alumni, the staff that support that area. Um, do a mentorship program too. So you can be connected with recent alumni um, to help guide you in this process of what life looks like after RISD. We also have a amazing career center that not only supports you while you're at RISD, but then also they will continue to support you after you graduate. We have a session with the director of the career center tomorrow. Um, it'll be a webinar. Uh, I put the link in the chat. I encourage you to sign up for that. A lot of people um, always say, a lot of current students always say one of the first things that they wish they did was reach out to the Career Center when they first got here because they don't realize the amount of resources that they provide you. So um, there are there are tools at your service here. So make sure if you do come to RISD that you take advantage of all of them. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Kevin Jankowski, is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, no, they, they're very helpful. Um, yeah, if you're here, it's like, yeah, yeah, get hooked up with that uh, career center because it's mm -hmm. a clearinghouse for information. It really is. 
Right. This is and, a great question. And they'll also help you prepare your portfolios. Um, let's see, that's another kind of support service. We have a writing center that I, they changed mm -hmm. their name. I don't know what it's called now. The Center, Center for, for Arts and Language. language. <laughs> <Yeah>. Arts and language. <laughs> okay, I was on sabbatical last year. Sorry, I mean, you know. Oh, still, cool. I'm still catching up. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, even people are writing cover letters, writing your CV, mm -hmm. talking about how do you, how you rep represent yourself on paper. I mean, all of the, those types of things are available. All right. Um, can you elaborate a little on the um, uh, teaching assistantships? Um, do graduate students have an opportunity to be a TA for undergraduate painting students? Yes, they do. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what I've been doing all morning, preparing for spring TAs. Um, yeah, I know. Throughout the curriculum, um, we, we tend to assign the graduate TAs to our to our core curriculum, their sophomore painting one and two, junior painting two, three and four, um, and some less so with, amongst the senior um, senior workshop senior degree projects. But uh, also we we assign people to um, there's a contemporary art seminar um, as well as TAing with. Uh, uh, a course we call the prehistory of contemporary art. Um, those are different types of TAs, but we do we do have those TAs as well. Um, there's also an opportunity to TA at Brown University. We send two people up there per year. Um, but uh, within the um, undergrad curriculum, uh, working in the junior uh, painting class, which is a course I teach. Uh, my TAs um, are there meeting with the students. The junior curriculum is is kind of about um, beginning to kind of develop your your kind of independence because the sophomore year is about learning skills and and learning tools, and uh, junior year is about beginning to actually use those skills and those tools uh, independently. So. It's an interesting experience um, because the students are so driven. Um, they're intense um, and they're hungry. And um, they're gonna be looking to you to help guide them as well. So, you know, they, it's it's a great group. You know, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but at the, at the end of the day, you sort of leave energized by these these kids. That's awesome, great. Um, this is an application question. Can you speak to a little bit about how um, applications are reviewed by the department? Um, who's actually reviewing reviewing the applications and portfolios for um, applicants? Who's reviewing? Faculty, mm -hmm. all the time faculty are reviewing them. Um, yeah, we, you know, spend, you know, I'm not quite sure how what the numbers are. Usually, it's around you know two something, two hundred people applying, um, and um, yeah, we we are looking at everything that you send to us. There's uh, the applications have some uh, written options, written requirements, um, and of course the portfolio. There's letters of recommendation um and transcripts so it's like you know we're just leafing through all of this and of course you know i i feel like a little bit priority goes to what the work looks like because you know at the end of the day you know your work is going to have to speak for you mm -hmm. yeah so. that's something we definitely say you know we do review the application holistically mm -hmm. um but uh the portfolio is the portfolio and the statement of purpose are the most important elements of the application. Yeah. And uh, the segues into a, another good question um, are in regards to letters of recommendation. Um, this particular person comes from a background outside of um, a painting. They come from architecture. Do you suggest that they get letters of recommendation from architecture faculty 
or would you prefer individuals that are more relevant to art? Um, I'm going to say both um, because, you know, it, it'd be nice to learn a little bit uh, from your architectural faculty to get a sense of the student. Um, right. yeah. who, who was that student? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, <clears throat> somebody who understands the language of painting. Um, who's going to be able to kind of speak to some of that more specifically. So, yeah, that's my answer. That's that great. Was... Thank you, Dwayne. Okay. All right, this is a good question. Any suggestions for how to condense our practice thoughts into a 750 word count uh, for the statement of purpose? <laughs> Condensing, let's see. Um, <laughs> get a really good editor. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, the first thought is like, you know, occasionally, you know, you run into, you know, and, and you know, I think everybody's guilty of this. Um, I know I was guilty of this. Um, one day I decided, and, and it took me a long time to undecide it, um, that uh, I was going to make the last painting. <laughs> the last painting I was ever going to make. It had to, it had to encompass everything. Um, and that just, yeah, that just did not work at all. Um, it just, you know, it, it creates what we might call it the grand failure. Um, what my recommendation is to uh, um, maybe start by focusing on the um, the subject of your work. Um, and then starting to write around that. Because I think in the writing around that, you're, uh, you, you know, whatever your methodology is, however you're thinking, um, is going to reveal itself. Um, it's going to be indirect, but it, but it can it, it can begin to kind of reveal itself. That's what I think. Um, art already has a way, you know, it's, it's, it's so indirect at times. Um, and you know sometimes writing writing can be very indirect but at the same time it's like you know you're talking to to a group of professional artists um your reviewers the painting faculty are um practicing we're all exhibiting artists um we read we write we do all of those things and they can read between the lines um, they'll be able to pick up on the different cues. And I think, yeah, just trust the writing. Um, but don't try to include everything. You're going to kill yourself. That's great. Thank you, Dwayne. All right. Um, could you um, please talk um, a little bit more about winter session and um, what that looks like for an MFA painting student? Yeah, winter session. Um, one of the things to know about RISD is uh, our semesters are 12 weeks long. Um, a standard semester is uh, 13, or no, no, more than that, 15, 15 weeks long. Uh, when you add finals, it's 16. When you add finals, uh, we're dealing with 13 weeks. Um, the idea was years and years, um, even before I was, you know, Back in the age of the dinosaur, um, the school decided that they wanted some kind of winter session program. Um, so what they did was they took a standard 15-week semester, shaved three weeks off it, you know, off, off the fall and the spring to create a six-week winter session. And the idea of the winter session is to allow people in their majors to take electives. Um, they can take electives and they could also take travel courses, something they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to do when their majors courses are running. So that's, that's the hope, that's the origin of the winter session. Um, that's great. 
but the idea is to take is to yeah um once you get here it's, and you read the curriculum you see the types of courses that are available to you um yeah it's you know most most grads most of the people that get here are like kids in the candy store they want everything um you know they could take again you know like fav courses we've had students do you know begin you know their trajectory into animation by taking animation courses um doing a lot of stuff with stop motion um we've had a lot of people taking glass courses because they want to add some sort of component of glass sculpture to their work um there's all kinds of printmaking um one student i know is interested in a graphic design what is it letterpress um he's actually going into doing letterpress um so you know with a little help when i've negotiated a spot for him within the graphic design department so it's Great. you know that's that's the winter session it's it's time to kind of uh you can relax a little bit uh you don't have your faculty looking over your shoulder um and you can kind of get another sense of yourself and regroup in preparation for the spring semester. Because the spring semester is when everything comes raining down on us. That's awesome. Um, but this is a portfolio question. Would you, would you be okay if someone included a short ex experimental film in their portfolio? Oh yeah, perfect. Love it. Yes. What do you think is important to include in your statement of purpose? I know you kind of touch upon this already. For example, um, your work is connected to where you are born and the heritage of the community, if it's necessary to include how you transition as to become an artist from childhood, undergrad, uh, childhood, undergrad, like their life story. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Include it, I say. Um... You know, if it's if it's you know such a if it, if your life story, well, I don't say your life story. If your statement cannot be a statement without a reference to your life story, then you know, um, you know, this is your work. You're this is this is the beginning of you beginning to articulate and defend your own work, mm -hmm. um, and to you know, somehow it's like it's it's a kind of an affirmation. It's it it demonstrates a certain sort of independence, um, and uh, even courage, um, to kind of begin to talk like this, um, because you know in this program you you know you're going to be asked a lot of questions, so, um, again you know your reviewers you know this is not our first rodeo, um, we've been doing this for a while. Um, the one part I forgot to mention was when we do these reviews as as the faculty, um, we kind of break it up into groups because of, you know because it takes time to review each application, and then the faculty get together again to confer, to talk, um, and to share notes. So it's you know it's it's a long process for us, but uh, it's you know it's it's worth the time and investment. And again, it's like, yeah, biography. I, yeah, include biography. That's great. Thank you. And the, painting is one of the programs that does do interviews, correct? Um, as part of the application process when they're working on um, narrowing down to their finalists. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, that process? Um. Yes, the interview process. Um, yeah, we have the, I'm not quite sure if uh, we're doing it in Zoom or if it, you know, in the past we had done them live. Um, folks came from wherever they, they, they're coming from. They brought some work, actual work. We looked at it and we, uh, you met with, um, the faculty as a group 
and everyone, you know, we had a conversation. We have a set of questions we operate by um, in this interview. And um, yeah, it's nerve wracking for uh, for the the interviewee. Um, what what else, what else was in that question? I'm trying to figure. It's just it, you know every department does the the review and the interview a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, not all programs do interviews. Yeah. So you know what? Just like what can people expect? And how can they prepare for it? Hmm. I don't know what to expect. You, well, I mean, you're showing your work. You need to talk about your work. Talk about the ideas behind it. Be ready to represent your work um, and to represent yourself. You may be asked questions about your statement. Just, you know, they're almost like conversational starters to some degree. Just to kind of begin to engage um, the other component, of course, is that the interviewee is for them. It's a chance to kind of interview the interviewer um, to get a sense of who we are, um, and you know, every you know, <laughs> I can't help but think everybody's everybody's sort of inspecting each other, um, trying to decide if if this is what they want to do, but. Right. It's, you know, it's like any other kind of interview. It's like, you know, just put your best foot forward, right? That's great. All right. We um, have talked about the curriculum. We've talked about winter session and fall and spring. What is expected of uh, students to do in the summer between their first and second year? Um, that's like an old, that's, that's such a graduate school thing when I was in graduate school um I actually um received an opportunity to go to the Vermont Studio Center uh in Johnson Vermont it was like one of these little artist colonies type situations um and it's kind of, it was pretty much an academic s setting but it was you know it, it was an art art camp basically um and uh i told my graduate advisor you know i have this opportunity to go to vermont um I, you know i want to be there for like six weeks you know i get to work with these different visiting artists and they came back at me with no don't you can't go you have to stay here you have to do the test the test is uh, um, directing your own work um, in the time that you have over the summer unsupervised. And of course, I didn't listen. They couldn't stop me. Um, I went to Vermont. And, uh, you know, the students, you know, I talked to them here. Uh, a lot of people, you know, their their sense of this is that uh, yeah you know we have this studio this big studio we have it it's ours it's all ours twenty four seven all summer um, I'm going to use it and so you know that's the idea there is that idea about um, when you're in you know kind of the oven of the school um, fall winter session spring semester. Um, it's intense. There's, you know, there's, you've got people asking questions constantly. Um, and so it is a good idea to have that kind of peace of mind, that separation, to just kind of sift through everything that's been discussed in regards to your work, in, in regards to your studio practice, um, and to just be able to have the time to, to generate work and maybe to find another pace or re-strategize. Um, years ago, we had a student from LA. He was very cool. And he was one of those those people that um, I've seen this happen to different with different. Seen it twice, where somebody like had an entourage, and he. Um, I always say that he had a boy cloud around him. 
he would he would go someplace and his gang his entourage would follow um and uh they would you know and he would coolly smoke cigarettes and they would all start coolly smoking cigarettes with um and it took this person a while to get used to being in graduate school because one time he literally said to me in mid-october why is everybody always asking me questions and, <laughs> and i was like because you're in graduate school so you know fast forward um mid-november i run into the student and say hey how you doing you know we're, we're, you know, we're, we're over by his studio and he invite, invites me to his studio and he's showing me some of the paintings he's working on and then he's showing me some of the books he's got and he starts leafing through all the books talking about his, the different ideas about um, that he's forming about brutalist architecture in LA and then looking, showing me images of other types of architecture um, and he was just kind of sort of, he just got lost. He's just like, all of a sudden, he's, he's just zooming forward, discussing all these things he's interested in. And I was like, you know, I'll say his name was Stan. I, I was like, Stan, Stan. Um, I said, and he just kind of stopped. I startled him because I actually had to reach out and, and grab him by the arm. I could stand, stand, you know, you know, and he goes, what, what? And uh, I go, do you know what you sound like? <laughs> and Stan's looking at me, goes, no, what do I sound like? And I said, Stan, you sound like a graduate student. <laughs> so, That's good. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens. It's, it's strange it's seeing, you know, the class or the student, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Diving back in. Um, mm -hmm. What is, so I have a lot of similar, similar type of questions. Um, what if my undergraduate background was in painting, but since then, um, they've completed other programs and fields completely unrelated to art. Would a professional in the art world, would a professional in the art world, but was not a professional of yours, is of yours be considered a better reference than somebody who is more familiar with you in an academic context? Okay. It's a little wordy question. So if you're underground, you're underground, undergrad, background isn't in painting right uh what if your undergrad background was in painting but what? since then you've completed other programs and fields completely unrelated to art i think they're asking if like is it better to have a recommendation from someone who's not directly related, like a teacher mm -hmm. an art teacher um somebody who would speak to to their potential as a RISD student, but isn't a teacher, an art teacher. Would you still recommend that? Um, yeah, I mean, if you feel that, that that's going to be the the better recommendation, if that's what you're more comfortable with. Sometimes, yeah, if you've been away for a while, um, you lose contact with with you know these former mentors and teachers, and so they may they may not be up to date with what you're doing. So. If you if they feel you know you know again it's like it's kind of like you know the work really is doing we're really asking the work to do most of the talking here mm -hmm. so um, at the same time you know these references um, yeah you know, I don't see a big problem with that I don't I, you know there are no red flags on this. It, it happens, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, we get applications like this where people, you know, you know, maybe, you know, some people have been out of school for a while and, um, or they were in school, you know, they did one thing and then they, they started doing painting after 
so they don't have you know the connections to the community uh to an academic community where you're, where you're going to get a former professor writing for you great all right, this is um, a curriculum question and you may have touched upon it, um, but could you please elaborate on the graduate painting class? Is this a seminar or a painting and drawing class? It's a seminar, it's a little bit of both seminar. Um, there are a lot of readings that are given in discussion sessions, <laughs> videos, sometimes field trips um, and um, at the same time, there are, you know, a couple of weeks where um, you're getting nothing but studio visits from your, your professor. So, you know, you're expected to be in your studio at, a, you know, at the time that you sign up. They're usually like 30, 35, sometimes 40 minute sessions where, you know, it's just you and your professor talking about your work. Um and of course, there's you know there's there's more than one person per semester checking in with you. Uh, we have a position called the floater. <laughs> the floater is this person who sees both first and second years. So you know you see them less obviously because there's more spread out, but uh, the floater um, definitely visits, and so you know you've got uh, other kinds of voices. But yeah, it is a it is a seminar, but it's also you know studio component as well. We do these midterms, by the way, as part of the the curriculum. Um, we have two things. I got taking my notes here. Um, we call them walkthroughs, and then there's the midterms. The walkthroughs are very short visits, usually um, at the end of the fall semester. Um, a small group of the faculty will uh, come through your studio for about 15 minutes. It'll be like four or five faculty um, just to talk to you about you know where your work has gone, where it is, um, answer any questions, but also find out you know, you know, just what, what maybe, you know, help you set some goals, just talking, you know, it is a crit and uh, they're just responding to, to where you are. Um, it's, it's sort of a final, but for some reason we call them walkthroughs. These are, these are, this is an old curriculum. So um, we inherit these terms, the walkthrough. I think they call it a walkthrough because it's about 15, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the midterms are done um, once per semester. Um, it's where all 20 of the students are together. And during, for instance, this past fall for our midterms, we had um, seven to eight faculty present to talk about the work. So, you know, when I talk about the idea about how intense the curriculum is, um, that's part of it. Um, are these kinds of midterms? So you're so you're getting around thirty five minutes of just of direct attention. You are on stage, and you've got all these people talking about what it is they see going on in your work, and you, of course, are introducing it as well. So it's it's an intense program. And um, but it's it's sort of the um, the one thing that people really enjoy. Is that great? Yeah. Um, let's see here. All right, this is a great question. Um, in terms of critiques and meetings that are had with faculty and visiting artists, are painting grad students encouraged to completely change their style, or is the advice more about the subject? and methodology of the work? Um, you know, sometimes it's it's the critique in, in the critique environment. It's, um, <laughs> there, 
you're directing the activity. And so sometimes there are people that, that choose to completely change their style. Um, and at the same time, it's like, you know, is it really changing anything? Um, just through the, uh, the number of conversations that you're having with your faculty and groups of faculty, um, it just seems like, yeah, the, 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 the person's, you know, because it's assumed that by the time you come into the program, um, you've reached a level of maturity beyond what an undergrad would be doing. Um, and so there are going, you know, you, you have, you're following a subject, you're following a methodology. And I think, you know, you can mask it with style, but I think it's still going to, going to come evident. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. We have um, a few minutes left, so we'll try to answer the remaining questions in that time. If we don't get to your question, um, you can email us. Um, but uh, this is another question on, about crits. How often are there are other one-on-one -on -one crits? Like, you know, one-on-one. One-on-one? -on -one. One -on -one? Yeah. Well, you know, like for instance, all my crits are, I see people three times per semester. That's a one-on-one. -on -one. There's also the, um, your grad, you know, uh, critic, your lead critic. They are seeing you one-on-one -on -one quite a bit, probably at least six times a semester. Um, sometimes it's like, you know, two hours of the class is devoted to group discussion. And then the rest of it is individual meetings. So, you know, we're just looking at, you know, the different um, structures that people use in their, in their class, how they approach the class. The other thing is, um, it is possible, you know, it happened and we, we encourage this. Um, if there's a professor, you know, that you want to, to talk to, or you would like to have a studio critique with, you're certainly encouraged to contact them um, and try to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them. Um, this, this goes on all the time. And even with faculty outside of the curriculum. So. That's great. Um, this is a really good question and we might be ending with this question. But it's more of like, you know, when people are choosing between RISD and other schools, like, you know, the, the why RISD question. Um, so this, this person's asking, um, many MFA programs require 60 credits in two years. RISD um, requires 120. What are the benefits of requiring 120 credits and how do you we see the extra time in relation to value? So now what? Let me see. <laughs> sixty credits in. I thought that was sixty credits per year. Yeah, so. yeah. You know what? Actually, it's. I believe it's this person. Um, it's one hundred and twenty credits for undergrads. Is that correct, Mirren? One hundred and twenty. I mean, I for. I forget. To be honest. So, so yeah, I think I. I think That's I think one hundred and twenty credits is is the undergrad program. Um. I put, I shared the curriculum in the um in the chat and the chat I'll share it again it's not sorry I was just reading the question yeah. um I can share no. it, but but it's not 120 credits sorry to I scare thought, anybody the grads, the grads is 66 yeah no it's yeah you're correct sorry yeah. it is so it's it's on par with the other programs yeah um Okay, let's see here. Um, but really, though, it's the, the question of like, why, why RISD? Why RISD? Uh, one of the programs here, well, the, the characteristic of this program has always been that people don't fall through the cracks. We're only taking 10 people. Uh, and uh, so it's, you know, that's one of the problems some people might have is you can't hide in this program um, because you know, it's, it's, it's small, 
by comparison to many programs. Um, if you go to these Art Institute of Chicago, sometimes it appears like it's a degree mill. Um, whereas here it's like 10 and 10, 10 and 10, 10 and 10, 10 and 10. Um, and so it's impossible to, you know, to, to hide. Um, and we do that because, yeah, we, you know, you, you get a lot of attention or individual attention. Um, so if, if that's something you like, if you enjoy that conversation, um, I, I say that's, that's a good why risk. That's great. Thank you, Dwayne. And with that, I think that's a good closing for today. Um, the remaining questions are questions that we've answered throughout um, today's session. But if you have any questions um, afterwards, uh, feel free to email us at admissions at RISD.edu. This is the day one of our online events. We have four more days of online sessions where we have um, each of the departments represented. And we're ending Friday with an in-person event. So if you're on campus, feel free. If you're in, on campus, if you're in the area or you can travel here, we hope to see you in person. But with that, um, I just want to thank Marin for joining me and thank you, Dwayne, for your time today. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.